How do you want people to treat you when you're having a bad day? Or what if you're having a bad season of your life? How do you want people to treat you? In 2019, there was a rumor that went around with Adele that she was having marital difficulty and that her and her husband were separating. The rumors were true. And people were commenting to her on social media and particularly being difficult with her who didn't know much of the background of her story and she didn't reveal a whole lot of that. But people were coming out, of, out at her. In an interview, she said uh, about that time while she's writing the song, uh, wait a minute, take it easy on me. In other words, you're coming out, you don't know anything going on in my life, but all you see is my public life. You're coming out really hard. And that she wrote the song, Easy On Me, because of this response. You may have heard it in the lyric of about middle way through this um, song. She wrote this song to her nine-year-old son, Angelo. And she said in the lyric, talking about the divorce that she was having in her marriage, the struggles, and eventually the divorce. She said, I had good intentions and the highest hopes, but I know right now it probably doesn't even show. In an interview that I discovered of the song, the lyrics behind the song, she said this, and I want to read it to you. You'll see it here on the screen. I just felt like I wanted Angelo through this record when he's in his 20s and his 30s to know who I am and why I voluntarily chose to dismantle his entire life in the pursuit of my own happiness. I made him really unhappy sometimes. That's a real wound for me that I, real, that I don't know that I'll ever be able to heal. I want you to look at that lyric, uh, or actually that quote, and I don't know how that quote struck you. The way it struck me, it struck me in two different ways. On one level, none of us know what's going on in each of us our lives. We could see what's on the outside, but on the inside might be something that is tearing us up. And we never know, and we can't make judgments about people from the outside appearance. So on one level, I see it that way. On the second level, when I look at the quote just on its, just on its face value, there's some words that are challenging to me. The word dismantle. And also just the word I, how often it's used. In our culture today, we can elevate personal happiness above everything else. And you can see that in this, in this uh, quote. How do you respond, no matter how you interpret that, to people who believe different than you? In our culture today, whether you're on the left or the right, we tend to cancel each other. That if you don't line up with me 100%, then I cancel you, and I don't want to have a relationship with you. Should that be our attitude as Christians? How should we interact with people that we disagree with or that we're not sure we're totally lined up with? I think ultimately we got to look at the, the person of Jesus and how he interacted. If you know in John chapter 1, you'll know this verse. It's a very famous verse, verse, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, now catch this, full of grace and truth. In the person of Jesus, you see grace fully embodied, and you also see truth fully embodied in the same person. I would submit that the order of those is very important. That grace comes before the truth. Lead with grace. Grace is something that we often say before meals. It's a song. It's something we experience before we pay our credit card. We get a grace period. If somebody does something wrong, we call them, you are a disgrace. If somebody does treason against our country, they're considered persona non grata, which means person without grace. Grace is is part of our, 
fabric as a nation, but also living without grace is something that we don't want to experience. This passage that was read just a minute ago from the book of Matthew talks about grace and forgiveness, and I want to look at this and walk us through this. Matthew chapter 18, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open your Bibles. If you don't and you have a digital Bible or whatever, I invite you to access the sermon notes on the YouVersion app. Before I uh, look at this text, I want to give you a little bit of context behind it. In the context behind this, there's dealing with sin in the church, and Jesus talks about if you have something against, or your brother or sister has something against you, or you have against something somebody else, you need to address it to them directly and not around the world. So you direct it directly. And so this question came up from Peter in verse 21. Let's look at it together. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, I'm curious. I never thought of this until just this moment. How many times? How did Peter say that? How many times? Or was it just a general question? I think what Peter was looking for was a pat on the back from Jesus. Up to seven times? In other words, look how magnanimous I am. I offer forgiveness to up to seven times. But Jesus redefines that. He says, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Depending on your translations, it may say something different. It may say 70 times seven or 490 times. Was If we're going to be literal about this, was Jesus trying to say, You need to forgive up to 490 times, but at 491, we're cutting you off. There's no more forgiveness or grace. I don't think that was it. Jesus was saying the people of the kingdom of God are people who extend grace and forgiveness countless times. That's part of who we are as Christians. Now, he goes on to explain this a little bit in more detail in verse 23. He tells a story. He says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. 10,000 bags, that's a lot of gold, all right? In that culture, uh, estimates as scholars believe that that would have been worth 10 million dollars. Dollars, And to give you an idea, in the area of Jerusalem, Judea, Galilee, their annual tax revenue or income was about $800,000. So it's an astronomical amount. It'd be like if somebody won the Mega Millions Powerball of $1.3 billion. How do you comprehend that? I mean, that's just a huge amount of dollars. And the point of this story, it's an incomprehensible amount. Could you imagine if you had the winning lottery ticket? By the way, if you do have that, we're glad you're here. (laughs) And we have a special second offering coming up after the end of the service. But seriously, imagine if you won 700, the payout I read this morning, $780 million payout. Could you imagine getting that check and lending that to somebody? You would not do that, right? You, or if you did that, you would expect a return on investment. You want something to come back to you. Here in this story, there's a, a king who lends a huge amount of dollars to this person. Now notice what happens in verse 25. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. I want you to see the humor in this. Could you imagine if you owed such a great debt? Do you think an extra 25 days grace period is going to get you over the edge? There's no way it's going to happen. And in fact, he cries out for mercy. Verse 27, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. That word for pity in the original language is splankna, which is like a visceral, a visceral reaction of the gut. 
the servant, the master is just brokenhearted over this person. And instead of giving him extra time, he forgives him of the debt completely. Could you imagine if China said to us, you don't have to pay back any of your national debt? Could you imagine that? That would be unbelievable. And that's sort of what happens in this, in this story. But this is what happens next, verse 28. But when that servant went out and he found out, found out one of his fellow servants owed him a hundred silver coins. Some commentators believe this is like a measly 20 bucks. Others believe that, you know, if you read it, it says a hundred um, days wages. So imagine if somebody owed a third of your income for the year. That's a significant amount of money. You would want that paid back to you. But his response is the total opposite. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Look at those words. He uses the exact words that were used before that he gave to his master. But his response is complete opposite. Instead of showing mercy and pity and grace, Instead, he refuses. Instead, he sends him off, to, has him thrown into prison till he pay back the debt. Word gets back to the king about what had happened, about this man who had been shown great mercy, how he uh, treated this fellow servant. So it says in verse 32, the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't have you had shown mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. Now catch this last verse. This verse should make you sit on the edge of your seat. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. In other words, if you're not a person who extends forgiveness to other people, God is not going to be extending forgiveness to you. Or to make it a little bit more personal in the prayer that we pray every week, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The kingdom way of life in the kingdom of God is to offer mercy and grace to people, not to withhold it. There's a story that, uh, that I came across this week of a, a Christian social worker. He was a social worker who happened to be a Christian working in a secular agency. He was working with a woman who was putting herself in kind of questionable situations to earn money to uh, feed her drug habit. And he asked her a question that uh, I can still hear in my head. Um, the question was simply this, have you ever thought about going to the church? And her response was, why would I go to the church? I already feel bad enough about the things that I'm doing. If I go there, I'm gonna feel any worse. I would feel worse. Why do people in our culture, when you think about grace and mercy, the first thought isn't about the church. Instead, it's something different. Amazing grace is more than a hymn that we sing. Amazing grace is simply recognizing that there is nothing that we can do to make God love us more. And there's nothing that we can do to make God love us less. Grace is simply God's undeserved mercy to all human beings simply because God is love. Gordon MacDonald, in a quote that I uh, really like, it says this, the world can do almost anything as well or better than the church. You don't need to be a Christian to build houses or feed the hungry or heal the sick. But then he said, there is only th one thing the world cannot do. It cannot offer grace. When we look at the person of Jesus, we see grace all over the place. When there were lepers who needed healing, Jesus didn't say, I can talk to you from here. 
Jesus came over and touched the, them. The touch was part of the healing. Or think about the woman who was caught in adultery. He said, he said uh, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Or the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with, her, with this oil, with her hair, and people were ridiculing her. He said, this will not be taken of her. In fact, this story will be told about her the rest of her life. We see grace in the way Jesus dealt with people. We see Jesus eating with sinners, and he said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. Jesus exuded grace, and each time that we, as the body of Christ, do that, he still extends his grace. But if you're like me at all, you have trouble sharing grace with people. You know it theologically, you know I should do this, but sometimes viscerally it's hard. And sometimes we can hold grudges towards people or we can believe things about them that aren't true. Some of you might be familiar with the fundamental attribution error. The simple idea behind the fundamental attribution error is simply the behavior of somebody that is different than you, the behavior of somebody is because of their character but if you exhibit the same behavior, there's some sort of outside circumstance which you use to excuse yourself. Let me give you an example. Have you ever been to work and you see somebody come in late to work? What's the first thought in your mind? Do you think, man, they must have had a tough day? Or maybe they, uh, uh, you know, they had bad traffic. No, you can think they're lazy. And maybe they just didn't make it a priority to get up in time to show up for work. But if you are late for work, bad traffic today. It's not my fault. I am not to blame. I read a story this week of a guy named Pete Gregg. Pete Gregg uh, was a Christmas service, and he's a pastor, and he would share the services at this. Imagine a huge uh, Christmas service, orchestra, everything in London, England. He was on his way to that, um, to that service. They had packed services, a lot of people there. And he tried to call them because he was running late. And everybody had their cell phones off. And he's not going to be there on time. So they play the music. They're waiting for the preacher to come up. And there's dead silence. Where was he? And the other pastor, his name was Nicky Gumble. He came up and said, I don't know what happened to him. And then they did the, the next hymn, and he said a few words. A little bit later, Pete showed up. And as he showed up, uh, he said he loved Nicky Gumbel's face because this was the service that everybody, you do not want to be late for this service. And he tried to reach out. And the first words that came out of Nicky Gumbel's mouth were simply this. You're not dead. In other words, the only reason that you, I thought you'd be late for this service or not here is because you'd be dead, and you're not dead, and therefore we can celebrate. And he said they went back to eat after the service and enjoy each other's company. He believed the best about that person, right? He extended grace. One of my favorite stories of grace is a story from Les Miserables, or as my friend Joel calls it, uh, Les Miserables. Uh, and you, some of you know this story, beautiful um, uh, play by Victor Hugo. Um, and in this story, um, it's a story of Jean Valjean. And in this story, this was uh, by Hugh Jackman, who you, you saw the movie. But there's a scene in this movie and in this story you might remember. Uh, fantastic story of grace. Uh, Jean Valjean was younger than this picture. Uh, he was, uh, went to prison because he stole bread, and he was doing hard labor for 19 years. He got out of prison, and he, back in those days, uh, you had to have a card and to like get in a hotel, and nobody would put him up in a hotel. Finally, he went to a church, and there was a bishop who let him in and, and let him stay the night. During the night, some of you know this story, he rummaged around and he wondered about what he was going to do. And so he took the silverware, literally the silver, and left early. Some cops caught him and he gave him a story that the bishop gave him the silver. 
And so they came back to corroborate the story before the bishop. And the bishop, when he saw him and he heard the story, he said, I wondered where you went. You forgot the best part. You forgot the candlesticks. And he gave him the candlesticks. And the police officers were amazed, I mean, that this story was true. And, it, and they left. And then in the, in the story, let me get the line right, in the musical, it says this, Use this silver to become an honest man. I have saved your soul for God. And if you know that that musical, you'll know what goes on with the rest of his life. He doesn't live life for himself. He lives his life for others. He extends grace. Probably the most helpful image when I think about grace is, I think Philip Yancey coined the term a grace dispenser. If you've gone to the bathroom and you've hit one of those automatic dispensers that comes out, you know, it just keeps coming out to wash your hands. Every time I see one of those dispensers, I want to encourage you to think of yourself as a grace dispenser. So the people that you have in your life this week or in your family or maybe somebody who has hurt you, will you offer grace? Or are you going to lead with truth? Am I saying that you should not have any accountability? There should be no truth? I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, if you identify with Christ, we should lead with grace. And in particular, my prayer for us at Central is that we would be more and more that kind of congregation that leads with grace. Because we never know what each of us is going through. We should extend grace. Because God's grace not only leads us to understand and say yes to Jesus, God's grace transforms us so that we can become more like him. Dallas Willard puts it this way, Christians burn grace like jet fuel. So may you extend grace. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect on your tremendous grace that you've extended to us. That there was no way that we could pay the debt of sin and how it separated us from you. And that you extended that grace in Jesus Christ to make us new people and to transform us. Lord, some of us right here this morning might need to feel some grace might need to feel some grace, not just from each other, but from you. Help them to hear your voice above all the other voices that compete for their attention or the inner critic which is in them. I pray that you'll help them to hear, you are my son, you are my daughter. With you, I am well pleased. We thank you for Jesus who modeled what it means to be a grace-filled person And help us to become more and more of that in the situations that we find ourselves. And may your church, not just Central, not just the United Methodist Church, may all the church around the world be more identified with the movement of grace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.